Welcome to part two of block one airway equipment types of ETT airway devices. Moving forward, let's look at video laryngoscopes. The fourth edition of the airway management textbook has been renamed to Hagberg and Benyamov and updated by Dr. Aziz and Dr. Brambrink. I extracted a little bit of history from the previous edition and on this slide you can see that predating the uh, GlideScope video laryngoscope there were other devices and other inventors. While some inventors concentrated on using standard laryngoscope blades, others designed and devised video laryng laryngoscopes with highly curved blades. And this slide from the third edition is a good example of highly curved blades. This slide, also from the third edition, has photographs of a variety of video laryngoscopes and depending on where you work, you may have the opportunity to use some of these. I thought it interesting to present to you the conclusions from the third edition first. Direct laryngoscopy for intubation confers the advantages of familiarity, direct glottic visualization, cost effectiveness, equipment availability, and a steep learning curve. However, the prevalence of Carmack Lehane grade 3 views at direct laryngoscopy is stubbornly persistent. Adjunctive maneuvers such as external laryngeal manipulation and head lift, together with accessories such as introducers, bougies, remain crucial to the success of unexpected difficult direct laryngoscopy. The same authors in 2013 extended their conclusions to uh, say that uh, video laryngoscopes are mobile and quick to set up and play an important role in the management of an unexpected difficult airway. Overall, in 2013, the prevailing opinion was that the gold standard for management of predicted airway difficulties with when oxygenation after induction of anesthesia cannot be ensured is the use of a flexible fiber optic device in an awake, spontaneously breathing patient. And in 2019, have things changed? The fourth edition says, the opportunity to take still pictures or video record airway management stands to alter the approach to the medical record. Video assisted laryngoscopy does not appear to help experienced anesthesiologists handle routine airway management in the operating room as success rates with conventional direct laryngoscopy are already very high. However, for the novice provider or for patients predicted to be difficult to intubate by DL, Video assisted laryngoscopy improves intubation success rates. Other pearls include the uh, statement that video assisted laryngoscopy provides a high likelihood of success as a rescue technique, uh, that uh, it can fail, and also that the ability to reduce cervical motion while applying manual inline stabilization has not yet been fully determined. 
Interestingly, it is associated with an increased risk of pharyngeal injury. So what's the bottom line? I don't know that I can give you a definitive bottom line, except to say that it's important for anesthesiologists to know their equipment and know what they can do with it. Uh, it is uh, reasonable to experiment, explore the options and uh, novel approaches. However, um, uh, it's critically important that you understand the uh, the intended purposes of uh, the airway equipment that you're using. Now it's time to move on to endotracheal tubes. When I started my residency, endotracheal tubes were mainly made of PVC, although there were red rubber latex tubes also in use. Red rubber latex tubes were originally cut from a roll back in the day and therefore had a natural curve to them. Metal connectors were used. The connector size was eventually standardized to 15 millimeters in, and 22 millimeters. Tubes were uncuffed. They were reused. Now disposable cuffed PVC endotracheal tubes are the norm. Modern endotracheal tubes are typically single lumen cuffed tubes. The cuffs can be designed to exert a low pressure or a high pressure against the tracheal mucosa. The tracheal mucosa is perfused by capillary pressure which is relatively low. There are still uncuffed tubes and they may be placed orally, nasally, or they may be designed to be used either orally or nasally. Tubes tend to have markings on them which indicate the length and sometimes they have markings which indicate where uh, a typical position would be at the level of the glottis. There are special endotracheal tubes, anode tubes, also known as flexometallic, wire reinforced, or armored tubes. There are preformed oral and preformed nasal tubes. The original tube Described, uh, invented by doctors Ring, Adair, and Elwin was called the Ray Tube. Since this is a trademark, other companies, when describing preformed tubes, may use the phrase or term North Polar or South Polar for nasal or oral preformed tubes. There are Parker tubes, laser tubes, and double lumen tubes. The armored tube or reinforced tube at one time was heavily favored for head and neck cases, including neurosurgery cases, for prone cases, and the reason for this was that the PVC tubes of the day were often quite kinkable and having a wire reinforced wall reduced the likelihood of kinking. However, from this slide you can see that it is possible for total obstruction of the wire reinforced tube to occur. I always suggest that the inquiring mind use the internet to access 
industry catalogs and brochures. When it comes to endotracheal tubes, I have found the Portex catalog on the Smith's medical website to be quite informative. Now, in talking about special single lumen tubes, I'd like to bring to your attention a uh, product made by Portex, and uh, the material is uh, what they call ivory. It's not transparent, but it is very soft. You may have seen this same material used for some nasal airways. There are other less frequently used tubes made with silicone material, and there are microlaryngeal endotracheal tubes, which are essentially of a small caliber or diameter, but of a normal length. We will discuss double lumen tubes in a separate video cast. I have used nasal ivory tubes for head and neck cases way back in the 1980s in Australia. I have not seen them used in this country and they may or may not be available. Nonetheless, the manufacturer's description of the product benefits do uh, bear review. And um, as you can see on this slide, uh, the uh, preformed bend should lie comfortably at the nares and the, uh, the uh, company suggests that it could be cut shorter for post-operative suctioning. This would require a uh, proper connector. At least for Portex ivory tubes, there are clear markings at the levels of the vocal cords and nares to assist in the correct placement. Again, these are average uh, measurements and may require some uh, individual attention when it comes to a patient. Conveniently, the size of the tracheal tube internal diameter is printed on the pilot balloon. And in the opinion of the manufacturer, the soft steel cuff is made from a very soft PVC material leading to a reduced risk of trauma, or perhaps, uh, in their view, um, the, a reduced risk of uh, mucosal damage from trough, cuff inflation. Here is an excerpt from the Portex catalog showing an ivory PVC north-facing nasal or north polar preformed endotracheal tube. As you can see, the uh, material is not transparent. I can tell you a uh, anecdotal story regarding the use of this tube, and I do re recall one time uh, easily inserting it in the nose, into the trachea, and then finding that I had no um, tidal volume. So it is possible that the bony structure of the nose is so strong and so uh, restricted that this tube can uh, be positioned correctly, properly, and yet not be able to ventilate the patient at all. So that is the downside of a very flexible wall. Since I brought up the original Ray tube and its inventors, Drs. Ring, Adair, and Elwin, I thought I would show you the original publication from 1975. My impression is that the oral Ray came first and that the nasal Ray 
followed. As you can see, these were originally uncuffed tubes. And in fact, the um, main benefit of the tube was that it could be moved from side to side and maybe did not require strong fixation uh, using tape because of the angle of the preformed bend. This is the end of part two, videocast block one.